Chapter Thirteen of the Best Man. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Mattern. The Best Man by Grace Livingston Hill. Chapter Thirteen. Glancing through the window, he saw that they were in front of a railroad track upon which a long freight train was rushing madly along at a giddy pace for a mere freight. The driver had evidently hoped to pass this point before the train got there, but had failed. The train had an exultant sound, as if it knew it had outwitted the driver. On one side of the street were high buildings, and on the other a great lumber yard, between which, in their carriage, there stood a team of horses hitched to a covered wagon, from the back of which some boards protruded, and this was on the side next to Celia, where the door would open. Gordon's heart leaped up with hope and wonder over the miracle of their opportunity. The best thing about their situation was that their driver had stopped, just a little back of the covered wagon, so that their door would open to the street directly behind the covered wagon. It made it possible for the carriage door to swing wide, and for them to slip across behind the wagon without getting too near to the driver. Nothing could have been better arranged for their escape, and the clatter of the empty freight cars drowned all sounds. Without delay, Gordon softly unlatched the door and swung it open, whispering to Celia, Go! Quick! over there by the fence in the shadow. Don't look around nor speak. Quick, I'll come. Trembling in every limb, yet with brave starry eyes, Celia slipped like a wraith from the carriage, stole behind the boards, and melted into the shadow of the great fence of the lumber yard, her purple plumes mere depths of shadow against the smoky planks. Gordon, grasping the suitcases, moved instantly after her, deftly and silently closing the carriage door and dropping into the shadows behind the big wagon, scarcely able to believe as yet that they had really escaped. Ten feet back along the sidewalk was a gateway, the posts being tall and thick. The gate itself was closed, but it hung a few inches inside the line of the fence, and into this depression the two stepped softly and stood, flattening themselves back against the gate as closely as possible, scarcely daring to breathe, while the long freight clattered and rambled its way by, like a lot of jolly washerwomen, running and laughing in a line, and spatting their tired, noisy feet as they went. Then the vehicles impatiently took up their onward course. Gordon saw the driver look down at the window below him, and glance back hastily over his shoulder, and the man on the other side of the box looked down on his side, the glitter of something in his hand shone for an instant in the glare of the signal light over the track. Then the horse lurched forward, and the cab began its crazy gait over the track and up the cobbled street. They had started onward without getting down to look in the carriage and see if all were safe with their prisoners, and they had not even looked back to see if they had escaped. They evidently trusted in the means they had used to lock the carriage doors, and had heard no sounds of their escaping. It was incredible, but it was true. Gordon drew a long breath of relief, and relaxed from his strained position. The next thing was to get out of that neighborhood as swiftly as possible, before those men had time to discover that their birds had flown. They would, of course, know at once where their departure had taken place, and come back swiftly to search for them, with perhaps more men to help, and a second time escape would be impossible. Gordon snatched up the suitcases with one hand, and with the other drew Celia's arm within his. "'Now we must hurry with all our might,' he said softly. "'Are you all right?' "'Yes.' Her breath was coming in a sob, but her eyes were shining bravely. "'Poor child!' His voice was very tender. "'Were you much frightened?' "'A little,' she answered more bravely now. "'I shall have hard work to forgive myself for all this.' he said tenderly, but we mustn't talk. We have to get out of this quickly, or they may come back after us. Lean on me, and walk as fast as you can. Celia bent her efforts to take long springing strides, and together they fairly skimmed the pavements, turning first this corner, then that, in the general direction from which Gordon thought they had come, until at last, three blocks away, they caught the welcome whirr of a trolley, and breathless, flew onward, just catching a car. They cared not where it went, so that they were safe in a bright light with other people. 
no diamonds on any gentleman's neck scarf ever shone to Celia's eyes with so friendly a welcome as the dull brass buttons on that trolley conductor's coat as he rang up their fares and answered Gordon's questions about how to get to East Liberty Station, and their pleasant homely gleam almost were her undoing, for now that they were safe at last, the tears would come to her eyes. Gordon watched her lovingly, tenderly, glad that she did not know how terrible had been her danger. His heart was still beating wildly with the thought of their marvellous escape, and his own present responsibility. He must run no further risks. They would keep to crowded trolleys, and trust to hiding in the open. The main thing was to get out of the city on the first train they could manage to board. When they reached East Liberty Station, a long train was just coming in, all sleepers, and they could hear the echo of a stentorian voice, "'Special for Harrisburg, Baltimore, and Washington. All aboard!' And up at the further end of the platform, Gordon saw the lank form of the detective, whom he had tried to avoid an hour before at the other station. Without taking time for thought, he hurried Celia forward, and they sprang breathlessly aboard. Not until they were fairly in the cars and the wheels moving under them did it occur to him that his companion had had nothing to eat since about twelve o'clock. She must be famished, and in a fair way to be ill again. What a fool he was not to have thought! They could have stopped in some obscure restaurant along the way, as well as not, and taken a later train. And yet it was safer to get away at once. Without doubt there were watchers at East Liberty, too, and he was lucky to have gone on the train without a challenge. He was sure that detective's face lighted strangely as he looked his way. Perhaps there was a buffet attached to the train. At least he would investigate. If there wasn't, they must get off at the next stop. There must be another stop, surely, somewhere near the city. He could not remember, but there surely must be. They had to wait some time to get the attention of the conductor. He was having much trouble with some disgruntled passengers, who each claimed to have the same berth. Gordon finally got his ear, and showing his stateroom tickets, inquired if they could be used on this train. No, growled the worried conductor. You're on the wrong train. This is a special, and every berth in the train is taken now but one upper. "'Then we'll have to get off at the next stop, I suppose, and take the other train,' said Gordon dismally. "'There isn't any other stop till somewhere in the middle of the night. "'I tell you, this is a special, and we're scheduled to go straight through. "'East Liberty's the last stop.' "'Then what shall we do?' asked Gordon inanely. "'I'm sure I don't know,' snapped the conductor. "'I've enough to do without mending other people's mistakes. "'Stay aboard, I suppose, unless you want to jump off and commit suicide.' "'But I have a lady with me who isn't at all well,' said Gordon with dignity. "'So much the worse for the lady,' replied the conductor inhumanly. "'There's one upper berth, I told you.' "'An upper berth wouldn't do for her,' said Gordon decidedly. "'She isn't well, I tell you.' "'Suit yourself,' snapped the harassed official. "'I reckon it's better than nothing. "'You may not have it long. "'I'm likely to be asked for it the next half minute.' "'Is that so?' "'And is there absolutely nothing else? "'Young man, I can't waste words on you. "'I haven't time. "'Take it or let it alone. "'It's all one to me. "'There's some standing room left in the day coach, perhaps.' "'I'll take it,' said Gordon meekly, "'wishing he could go back and undo the last half hour. "'How in the world was he to go and tell Celia "'that he could provide her nothing better than an upper berth? She was sitting with her back to him, her face resting wearily on her hand against the window. Two men with largely checked suits, big seal rings, and diamond scarf pins sat in the opposite seat. He knew it was most unpleasant for her. A nondescript woman with a very large hat and thick powder on her face shared Celia's seat. He reflected that specials did not always bear a select company. "'Is there nothing you can do?' he pleaded with the conductor as he took the bit of pasteboard, entitling him to the last vacant berth. "'Don't you suppose you could get some man to change and give her a lower berth? It'll be very hard for her. She isn't used to upper berths.' His eyes rested wistfully on the bowed head. Celia had taken off her plumed hat, and the fitful light of the car played with the gold of her hair. The conductor's grim eyes softened as he looked. "'That the lady?' 
I'll see what I can do, he said briefly, and stumped off to the next car. The miracle of her presence had worked its change upon him. Gordon went over to Celia and told her in a low tone that he hoped to have arrangements made for her soon so that she could be comfortable. She must be fearfully tired with the excitement and fright and hurry. He added that he had made a great blunder in getting on this train, and now there was no chance to get off for several hours, perhaps, and probably no supper to be had. "'Oh, it doesn't matter in the least,' said Celia wearily. "'I'm not all that hungry.' She almost smiled when she said it. He knew that what she wanted was to have her mind relieved about the letters, but she readily saw that there was no opportunity now. She even seemed sorry at his troubled look, and tried to smile again through the settled sadness in her eyes. He could see she was very weary, and he felt like a great brute in care of a child, and mentally berated himself for his own thoughtlessness. Gordon started off to search for something to eat for her, and was more successful than he had dared hope. The newsboy had two chicken sandwiches left, and these, with the addition of a fine orange, a box of chocolates, and a glass of ice water, he presently brought to her, and was rewarded by a smile this time, almost as warm and intimate as those she had given him during their beautiful day. But he could not sit beside her, for the places were all taken, and he could not stand in the aisle and talk, for the porter was constantly running back and forth, making up the berths. There seemed to be a congested state of things in the whole train, every seat being full, and men standing in the aisles. He noticed now that they all wore badges of some fraternal order. It was doubtless a delegation to some great convention, upon which they had intruded. They were a good-natured, noisy, happy crowd, but not anywhere among them was to be found a quiet spot where he and Celia could go on with their suddenly interrupted conversation. Presently the conductor came to him and said he had found a gentleman who would give the lady his lower berth and take her upper one. It was already made up, and the lady might take possession at once. Gordon made the exchange of tickets and immediately escorted Celia to it. He found her most glad to go, for she was now unutterably weary and was longing to get away from the light and noise about her. He led the way with the suitcases, hoping that in the other car there would be some spot where they could talk for a few minutes, but he was disappointed. It was even fuller than in the first car. He arranged everything for her comfort as far as possible, disposed of her hat, and fixed her suitcase so that she could open it, but even while he was doing it there were people crowding by, and no private conversation could be had. He stepped back when all was arranged, and held the curtain aside that she might sit on the edge of her berth. Then, stooping over, he whispered, "'Try to trust me until morning. I'll explain it all to you then, so that you will understand how I have nothing to do with those letters. Forget it, and try to rest, will you?' His tone was wistful. He had never wanted to do anything so much in all his life as to stoop and kiss those sweet lips, and the lovely eyes that looked up at him out of the dusky shadows of the berth, filled with fear and longing. They looked more than ever like the blue, tired flowers that drooped from her gown wearily. But he held himself with a firm hand. She was not his to kiss. When she knew how he had deceived her, she would probably never give him the right to kiss her. "'I will try,' she murmured in answer to his question, and then added, "'But where will you be? Is your berth nearby?' "'Not far away. That is, I had to take a place in another car. They are so crowded.' "'Oh,' she said a little anxiously, "'are you sure you have a good, comfortable place?' "'Oh, yes, I shall be all right,' he answered joyously. "'It was so wonderful to have her care, whether he was comfortable or not.' The porter was making up the opposite berth, and there was no room to stand longer. So he bade her good night, she putting out her hand for a farewell. For an instant he held it close, with gentle pressure, as if to reassure her. Then he went away to the day coach and settled down into a hard corner at the very back of the car, drawing his traveling cap over his eyes and letting his heart beat out wild joy over that little touch of her dear hand. Wave after wave of sweetness went over him, thrilling his very soul with a joy he had never known before. And this was love. And what kind of a wretch was he, 
presuming to love like this a woman who was the promised bride of another man. Ah, but such a man, a villain, a brute, who had used his power over her to make her suffer tortures. Had a man like that a right to claim her? His whole being answered, no. Then the memory of the look in her eyes, the turn of her head, the soft touch of her fingers as they lay for that instant in his, the inflection of her voice, would send that wave of sweetness over his senses, his heart would thrill anew, and he would forget the wretch who stood between him and this lovely girl, whom he knew now he loved, as he had never dreamed a man could love. Gradually his mind steadied itself under the sweet intoxication, and he began to wonder just what he should say to her in the morning. It was a good thing he had not had further opportunity to talk with her that night, for he could not have told her everything, and now, if all went well, they would be in Washington in the morning, and he might make some excuse till after he had delivered his message. Then he would be free to tell the whole story, and lay his case before her for decision. His heart throbbed with ecstasy, as he thought of the possibility of her forgiving him, and yet it seemed most unlikely. Sometimes he would let his wild longings fancy for just an instant what joy it would be if she could be induced to let the marriage stand. But he told himself at the same time that that could never be. It was very likely that there was someone else in New York to whom her heart would turn if she were free from the scoundrel who had threatened her into a compulsory marriage. He would promise to help her, protect her, defend her from the man who was evidently using blackmail to get her into his power for some purpose, most likely for the sake of having control of her property. At least it would be some comfort to be able to help her out of her trouble, and yet would she ever trust a man who had even unwittingly allowed her to be bound by the sacred tie of marriage to an utter stranger? And thus, amid hope and fear, the night whirled itself away. Forward, in the sleeper, the girl lay wide awake for a long time. In the middle of the night, a thought suddenly evolved itself out of the blackness of her curtained couch. She sat upright alertly, and stared into the darkness, as if it were a thing that she could catch and handle and examine. The thought was born out of a dreamy vision of the crisp brown waves, almost curls if they had not been so short and thick, that covered the head of the man who had lain sleeping outside her curtains in the early morning. It came to her with sudden force that not so had been the hair of the boy George Hain, who used to trouble her girlish days. His was thin and black and oily, collecting naturally into little isolated strings with the least warmth, and giving him the appearance of a kitten who had been out in the rain. One lock, how well she remembered that lock! One lock on the very crown of his head had always refused to lie down, no matter how much persuasion was brought to bear upon it. It had been the one point on which the self-satisfied George had been pregnable, his hair, that scalp lock that would always rise stiffly, oily from the top of his head, the hair she had looked at admiringly that morning in the dawning crimson of the rising sun, had not been that way. It had curved clingingly to the shape of the fine head, as if it loved to go that way. It was beautiful and fine and burnished, with a sense of life and vigor in its every wave. Could hair change in ten years? Could it grow brown where it had been black? Could it become glossy instead of dull and oily? Could it take on the signs of natural wave where it had been as straight as a dye? Could it grow like fur where it had been so thin? The girl could not solve the problem, but the thought was most startling and brought with it many suggestive possibilities that were most disturbing. Yet gradually out of the darkness she drew a sort of comfort in her dawning enlightenment two things she had to go on in her strange premises. He had said he did not write the letters, and his hair was not the same. Who then was he? Her husband now, undoubtedly, but who? And if deeds and hair could change so materially, why not spirits? At least he was not the same as she had feared and dreaded. There was so much comfort, and at last she lay down and slept. End of chapter 13 of the best man 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Mattern. The Best Man by Grace Livingston Hill. Chapter 14. It was not until the white dome of the Capitol and the tall needle of the monument were painted soft and vision-like against the sky, reminding one of the pictures of the heavenly city in the story of Pilgrim's Progress, and faintly suggesting a new and visionary world, that he sought her again and found her fully ready, standing in the aisle while the porter put up the berth out of the way. Beneath the great brim of her purple hat, where the soft fronds of her plumes trembled with the motion of the train, she lifted sweet eyes to him, as if she were both glad and frightened to see him. And then that ecstasy shot through him again, as he realized suddenly what it would be to have her for his life companion, to feel her looks of gladness were all for him, and have the right to take all fright away from her. They could only smile at each other for good morning, for everybody was standing up and being brushed, and pushing here and there for suitcases and lost umbrellas, and everybody talked loudly, and laughed a great deal, and told how late the train was. Then at last they were there, and could get out and walk silently side by side in the noisy procession through the station to the sidewalk. What little things sometimes change a lifetime, and make for our safety or our destruction! That very morning, three keen watchers were set to guard that station at Washington to hunt out the government spy who had stolen back the stolen message and take him, message and all, dead or alive, back to New York. For the man who could testify against the Holman combination was not to be let live if there was such a thing as getting him out of the way. But they never thought to watch the special which was supposed to carry only delegates to the great convention. He could not possibly be on that. They knew he was coming from Pittsburgh, for they had been so advised by telegram the evening before by one of their company, who had seen him buying a sleeper ticket for Washington. But they felt safe about that special, for they had made inquiries, and been told no one but delegates could possibly come on it. They had done their work thoroughly, and were on hand with every possible plan perfected for bagging their game. But they took the time when the Pittsburgh special was expected to arrive for eating a hearty breakfast in the restaurant across the street from the station. Two of them emerged from the restaurant doorway in plenty of time to meet the next Pittsburgh train, just as Gordon, having placed the lady in a closed carriage, was getting in himself. If the carriage had stood in any other spot along the pavement in front of the station, they never would have seen him, but, as it was, they had a full view of him, and because they were Washington men and experts in their line, they recognized him at once and knew their plans had failed, and that only by extreme measures could they hope to prevent the delivery of the message which would mean downfall and disaster to them and their schemes. As Gordon slammed shut the door of the carriage, he caught a vision of his two enemies pointing excitedly toward him, and he knew that the bloodhounds were on the scent. His heart beat wildly. His anxiety was divided between the message and the lady. What should he do? Drive at once to the home of his chief and deliver the message? Or leave the girl at his rooms, phone for a faster conveyance, and trust to getting to his chief ahead of his pursuers? Don't let anything hinder you. Don't let anything hinder you. Make it a matter of life and death, rang the little ditty in his ears, and now it seemed as if he must go straight ahead with the message. And yet, a matter of life and death, he could not, must not, might not take the lady with him into danger. If he must be in danger of death, he did not want to die having exposed an innocent stranger to the same. Then there was another point to be thought of. He had already told the driver to take him to his apartments, and to drive as rapidly as possible. It would not do to stop him now and change the directions, for a pistol shot could easily reach him yet. And, coming from a crowd, who would be suspected? His enemies were standing on the threshold of a place where there were many of their kind to protect them, and none of his friends knew of his coming. It would be a race for life from now on to the finish." Celia was looking out with interest at the streets, recognizing landmarks with wonder, 
and did not notice Gordon's white, set face and burning eyes as he strained his vision to note how fast the horse was going. Oh, if the driver would only turn off at the next corner, into the side street, they could not watch the carriage so far. But it was not likely, for this was the most direct road. And yet, yes, he had turned. Joy! The street here was so crowded that he had sought the narrower, less crowded way that he might go the faster. It seemed an age to him before they stopped at his apartments. To Celia, it had been but a short ride, in which familiar scenes had brought her pleasure, for she recognized that she was not in strange Chicago, but in Washington, a city often visited. Somehow she felt it was an omen of a better future than she had feared. "'Oh, why didn't you tell me?' she smiled to Gordon. "'It is Washington, dear old Washington.' Somehow he controlled the tumult in his heart and smiled back, saying in a voice quite natural, I am so glad you like it. She seemed to understand that they could not talk until they reached a quiet place somewhere, and she did not trouble him with questions. Instead, she looked from the window or watched him furtively, comparing him with her memory of George Hayne, and wondering in her own thoughts. She was glad to have them to herself for just this little bit, for now that the morning had come, she was almost afraid of revelation, what it might bring forth. And so it came about that they took the swift ride in more or less silence, and neither thought it strange. As the carriage stopped, he spoke with low, hurried voice, tense with excitement, but her own nerves were on a strain also, and she did not notice. We get out here. He had the fare ready for the driver, and stepping out, hurried Celia into the shelter of the hallway. It happened that an elevator had just come down, so it was but a second more before they were up safe in the hall before his own apartment. Taking a latch key from his pocket, he applied it to the door, flung it open, and ushered Celia to a large leather chair in the middle of the room. Then, stepping quickly to the side of the room, he touched a bell, and from it went to the telephone with an, "'Excuse me, please, this is necessary.' to the girl, who sat astonished, wondering at the home-likeness of this room, and at the at-homeness of the man. She had expected to be taken to a hotel. This seemed to be a private apartment, with which he was perfectly acquainted. Perhaps it belonged to some friend. But how, after an absence of years, could he remember just where to go, which door and which elevator to take, and how to fit the key with so accustomed a hand? Then her attention was arrested by his voice. "'Give me 254L, please,' he said. "'Is this 254L? Is Mr. Osborne in? "'You say he has not gone to the office yet? May I speak with him? "'Is this Mr. Osborne? I did not expect you to know my voice. "'Yes, sir, just arrived, and all safe so far. "'Shall I bring it to the house or the office? "'The house?' "'All right, sir, immediately. "'By the way, I am sure Hale and Burke are on my track. "'They saw me at the station. "'To your house? "'You will wait until I come? "'All right, sir. "'Yes, immediately. "'Sure, I'll take precaution. "'Good-bye.' "'With the closing words came a tap at the door. "'Come, Henry,' he answered, "'as the astonished girl turned toward the door. "'Henry?' You will go down, please, to the restaurant, and bring up a menu card. This lady will select what she would like to have, and you will serve breakfast for her in this room as soon as possible. I shall be out for perhaps an hour, and, meantime, you will obey any orders she may give you. He did not introduce her as his wife, but she did not notice the omission. She had suddenly become aware of a strange, distraught haste in his manner, and when he said he was going out— Alarm seized her. She could not tell why. The man bowed deferentially to his master, looked his admiration and devotion to the lady, waited long enough to say, "'I's mighty glad to see you back safe, sir,' and disappeared to obey orders. Celia turned toward Gordon for an explanation, but he was already at the telephone again. Forty-six. Is this the garage? This is the Harris Apartments.' Can you send Thomas with a closed car to the rear door immediately? Yes. 
No, I want Thomas in a car that can speed. Yes, the rear door, rear, and at once. What? What's that? But I must... It's official business. Well, I thought so. Hurry them up. Good-bye. He turned and saw her troubled gaze following him with growing fear in her eyes. What is the matter? she asked anxiously. Has something happened? Just one moment he paused, and coming toward her laid his hands on hers tenderly. Nothing the matter at all, he said soothingly. At least nothing that need worry you. It is just a matter of pressing business. I'm sorry to have to go from you for a little while, but it is necessary. I cannot explain to you until I return. You will trust me? You will not worry? I will try. Her lips were quivering, and her eyes were filled with tears. Again he felt that intense longing to lay his lips upon hers and comfort her, but he put it from him. There is nothing to feel sad about, he said, smiling gently. It is nothing tragic, only there is need for haste, for if I wait, I may fail yet. It is something that means a great deal to me. When I come back, I will explain all. Go, she said, putting out her hands in a gesture of resignation, as if she would hurry him from her. And though she was burning to know what it all meant, there was that about him that compelled her to trust him and to wait. Then his control almost went from him. He nearly took those hands in his and kissed them, but he did not. Instead, he went with swift steps to his bedroom door, threw open a chiffonier drawer, and took therefrom something small and sinister. She could see the gleam of its polished metal, and she sensed a strange little menace in the click as he did something to it. She could not see what, because his back was to her. He came out with his hand in his pocket, as if he had just hidden something there. She was not familiar with firearms. Her mother had been afraid of them, and her brother had never flourished any around the house, yet she knew by instinct that some weapon of defense was in Gordon's possession, and a nameless horror rose in her heart and shone from her blue eyes, but she would not speak a word to let him know it. If he had not been in such haste, he would have seen. Her horror would have been still greater if she had known that he already carried one loaded revolver and was taking a second in case of an emergency. "'Don't worry,' he called as he hurried out the door. "'Henry will get anything you need, and I shall soon be back.' The door closed, and he was gone. She heard his quick step down the hall, heard the elevated door slide and slam again, and then she knew he was gone down. Outside an automobile sounded, and she seemed to hear again his words at the phone. The rear door. Why had he gone to the rear door? Was he in hiding? Was he flying from someone? What? Oh, what did it mean? Without stopping to reason it out, she flew across the room and opened the door of the bedroom he had just left, then through it passed swiftly to a bathroom beyond. Yes, there was a window. Would it be the one? Could she see him? And what good would it do her if she could? She crowded close to the window. There was a heavy sash with stained glass, but she selected a clear bit of yellow and put her eye close. Yes, there was a closed automobile just below her, and it had started away from the building. He had gone then. Where? Her mind was a blank for a few minutes. She went slowly, mechanically back to the other room, without noticing anything about her, sat down in the chair, putting her hands to her temples, and tried to think back to the moment in the church where he had appeared at her side and the service had begun. Something had told her then that he was different, and yet there had been those letters, and how could it possibly be that he had not written them? He was gone on some dangerous business, of that she felt sure. There had been some caution given him by the man to whom he first phoned. He had promised to take precaution. That meant the little wicked gleaming thing in his pocket. Perhaps some harm would come to him, and she would never know. And then she stared at the opposite wall with wonder-filled eyes. Well, and suppose it did. Why did she care? Was he not the man whose power over her but two short days ago would have made her welcome death as her deliverer? Why was all changed now? 
just because he had smiled upon her and been kind, had given her a few wild flowers and said her eyes were like them, had hair that waved instead of being straight and thin, and where was all her loyalty to her dear dead father's memory? How could she mind that danger should come to one who had threatened to tell terrible lies that should blacken him in the thoughts of people who had loved him? Had she forgotten the letters? Was she willing to forgive all, just because he had declared that he did not write them? How foolish! He said he could prove that he did not, but of course that was all nonsense. He must have written them, and yet there was the wave in his hair, and the kindness in his eyes, and he had looked, oh, he had looked terrible things when he had read that letter, as if he would like to wreak vengeance on the man who had written it. Could a man masquerade that way? And then a new solution to the problem came to her. Suppose this, whoever he was, this man who had married her, had gone out to find and punish George Hayne. Suppose. But then she covered her eyes with her hands and shuddered. Yet, why should she care? But she did. Suppose he should be killed himself. Who was he if not George Hayne? And how did he come to take his place? Was it just another of George's terrible tricks upon her? A quick vision came of their bringing him back to her. He would lie, perhaps, on that great crimson leather couch over there, just as he had lain in the dawning of the morning in the stateroom of the train, with his hands hanging limp, and one, perhaps, across his breast, as if he were guarding something, and his bright waves of brown hair lying heavy about his forehead, only his forehead would be white, so white and cold, with a little blue mark in his temple, perhaps. The footsteps of the man Henry brought her back to the present again. She smiled at him pleasantly as he entered, and answered his questions about what she would have for breakfast, but it was he who selected the menu, not she, and after he had gone, she could not have told what she had ordered. She could not get away from the vision on the couch. She closed her eyes and pressed her cold fingers against her eyeballs to drive it away, but still her bridegroom seemed to lie there before her. The colored man came back presently with a loaded tray and set it down on a little table which he wheeled before her, as though he had done it many times before. She thanked him and said there was nothing else she needed, so he went away. She toyed with the cup of delicious coffee which he had poured for her, and the few swallows she took gave her new heart. She broke a bit from a hot roll and ate a little of the delicious steak, but still her mind was at work at the problem, and her heart was full of nameless anxiety. He had gone away without any breakfast himself, and he had had no supper the night before, she was sure. He probably had given to her everything he could get on the train. She was haunted with regret, because she had not shared with him. She got up and walked about the room, trying to shake off the horror that was upon her, and the dread of what the morning might bring forth. Ordinarily she would have thought of sending a message to her mother and brother, but her mind was so troubled now that it never occurred to her. The walls of the room were tinted a soft greenish-gray, and above the picture molding they blended into a woodsy landscape with a hint of water, greensward, and blue sky through interlacing branches. It reminded her of the little village they had seen as they started from the train in the early morning light. What a beautiful day they had spent together, and how it had changed her whole attitude of heart toward the man she had married. Two or three fine pictures were hung in good lights. She studied them and knew that the one who had selected and hung them was a judge of true art. But they did not hold her attention long, for as yet she had not connected the room with the man for whom she waited. A handsome mahogany desk stood open in a broad space by the window. She was attracted by a little painted miniature of a woman. She took it up and studied the face. It was fine and sweet, with brown hair dressed low, and eyes that reminded her of the man who had just gone from her. Was this then the home of some relative, with whom he had come to stop for a day or two? And if so, where was the relative? The dress in the miniature was of a quarter of a century past, 
yet the face was young and sweet, as young, perhaps, as herself. She wondered who it was. She put the miniature back in place with a caressing hand. She felt that she would like to know this woman with the tender eyes. She wished her here now, that she might tell her all her anxiety. Her eye wandered to the pile of letters, some of them official-looking ones, one or two in square, perfumed envelopes, with high, angular writing. They were all addressed to Mr. Cyril Gordon. That was strange. Who was Mr. Cyril Gordon? What had they, what had she, to do with him? Was he a friend whom George, whom they were visiting for a few days? It was all bewildering. Then the telephone rang. Her heart beat wildly, and she looked toward it as if it had been a human voice speaking, and she had no power to answer. What should she do now? Should she answer, or should she wait for the man to come? Could the man hear the telephone bell, or was she perhaps expected to answer? And yet, if Mr. Cyril Gordon... Well, somebody ought to answer. The phone rang insistently once more, and still a third time. What if he should be calling her? Perhaps he was in distress. This thought sent her flying to the phone. She took down the receiver and called, Hello! And her voice sounded far away to herself. Is this Mr. Gordon's apartment? Yes, she answered, for her eyes were resting on the pile of letters close at hand. Is Mr. Gordon there? No, he is not, she answered, growing more confident now, and almost wishing she had not presumed to answer a stranger's phone. Why, I just phoned to the office, and they told me he had returned, said a voice that had an imperious note in it. Are you sure he isn't there? Quite sure, she replied. Who is this, please? I beg your pardon, said Celia, trying to make time and knowing not how to reply. She was not any longer Miss Hathaway. Who was she? Mrs. Hain? She shrank from the name. It was filled with horror for her. Who is this, I said, snapped the other voice now. Is this the chambermaid? Because if it is, I'd like you to look around and inquire and be quite sure that Mr. Gordon isn't there. I wish to speak with him about something very important. Celia smiled. No, this is not the chambermaid, she said sweetly, and I am quite sure Mr. Gordon is not here. How long before he will be there? I don't know, really, for I have but just come myself. Who is this to whom I am talking? Why, just a friend, she answered, wondering if that were the best thing to say. Oh! There was a long and contemplative pause at the other end. Well, could you give Mr. Gordon a message when he comes in? Why, certainly, I think so. Who's this? Miss Bentley. Julia Bentley. He'll know, replied the imperious one eagerly now. And tell him, please, that he is expected here to dinner tonight. We need him to complete the number, and he simply mustn't fail me. I'll excuse him for going off in such a rush if he comes early and tells me all about it. Now you won't forget, will you? You got the name, Bentley, did you? B-E-N-T-L-E-Y, you know. And you'll tell him the minute he comes in? Yes. Thank you. What did you say your name was? But Celia had hung up. Somehow the message annoyed her. She could not tell why. She wished she had not answered the phone. Whoever Mr. Cyril Gordon was, what should she do if he should suddenly appear? And as for this imperious lady and her message, she hoped she would never have to deliver it. On second thought, why not write it and leave it on his desk with the pile of letters? She would do it. It would serve to pass away a few of these dreadful minutes that lagged so distressfully. She sat down and wrote, Miss Bentley wishes Mr. Gordon to dine with her this evening. She will pardon his running away the other day if he will come early. She laid it beside the high angular writing on the square perfume letters and went back to the leather chair, too restless to rest, yet too weary to stand up. She went presently to the back windows to look out and then to the side ones. Across the housetops she could catch a glimpse of domes and buildings. There was the Congressional Library, which usually delighted her, 
with its exquisite tones of gold and brown and white. But she had no eyes for it now. Beyond were more buildings, all set in the lovely foliage, which was much farther developed than it had been in New York State. From another window she could get a glimpse of the Potomac shining in the morning sun. She wandered to the front windows and looked out. There were people passing and repassing. It was a busy street, but she could not make out whether it was one she knew or not. There were two men walking back and forth on the opposite side. They did not go further than the corner of the street either way. They looked across at the windows sometimes and pointed up when they met, and once one of them took something out of his pocket and flashed it under his coat at his side, as if to have it ready for use. It reminded her of the thing her husband had held in his hand in the bedroom, and she shuddered. She watched them, fascinated, not able to draw herself away from the window. Now and then she would go to the rear window to see if there was any sign of the automobile returning, and then hurry back to the front to see if the men were still there. Once she returned to the chair, and lying back, shut her eyes, and let the memory of yesterday sweep over her in all its sweet details, up to the time when they had got into the way train, and she had seemed to feel her disloyalty to her father. But now her heart was all on the other side, and she began to feel that there had been some dreadful mistake somewhere, and he was surely all right. He could not, could not have written those terrible letters. Then again, the details of their wild carriage ride in Pittsburgh and miraculous escape haunted her. There was something strange and unexplained about that which she must understand. End of chapter 14 of the best man this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by gail mattern the best man by grace livingston hill chapter 15 meantime gordon was speeding away to another part of the city by the fastest time an experienced chauffeur dared to make about the time they turned the first corner into the avenue two burly policemen sauntered casually into the pretty square in front of the house where lived the chief of the secret service there was nothing about their demeanour to show that they had been detailed there by special urgency and three men who hurried to the little park just across the street from the house could not possibly know that their leisurely and careless stroll was the result of a hurried telephone message from the chief to police headquarters immediately after his message from Gordon. The policemen strolled by the house, greeted each other, and walked on around the square across the little park. They eyed the three men sitting idly on a bench and passed leisurely on. They disappeared around a corner, and to the three men were out of the way. The latter did not know the hidden places where the officers took up their watch, and when an automobile appeared, and the three stealthily got up from their park bench and distributed themselves among the shrubbery near the walk, they knew not that their every movement was observed with keen attention. But they did wonder how it happened that those two policemen seemed to spring out of the ground suddenly, just as the auto came to a halt in front of the chief's house. Gordon sprang out and up the steps with a bound, the door opening before him as if he were expected. The two grim and apparently indifferent policemen stood outside like two stone images on guard, while up the street with rhythmic sound rode two mounted police, also coming to a halt before the house as if for a purpose. The three men in the bushes hid their instruments of death and would have slunk away had there been a chance. But turning to make a hasty flight, they were met by three more policemen. There was the crack of a revolver as one of the three desperados tried a last reckless dash for freedom and failed. The wretch went to justice with his right arm hanging limp by his side. Inside the house, Gordon was delivering up his message, and as he laid it before his chief and stood silent while the elder man read and pondered its tremendous import, it occurred to him for the first time that his chief would require some report of his journey and the hindrances that had made him a whole day late in getting back to Washington. His heart stood still with sudden panic. 
What was he to do? How could he tell it all? What right had he to tell of his marriage to an unknown woman? A marriage that perhaps was not a marriage. He could not know what the outcome would be until he had told the girl everything. As far as he himself was concerned, he knew that the great joy of his life had come to him in her. Yet he could not hope that it would be so with her, and he must think of her and protect her good name in every way. If there should be such a thing ever as that she should consent to remain with him and be his wife, he must never let a soul know but what the marriage had been planned long ago. It would not be fair to her. It would make life intolerable for them both, either together or apart. And while he might be, and doubtless was, perfectly safe in confiding in his chief, and asking him to keep silence about the matter, still he felt that even that would be a breach of faith with Celia. He must close his lips upon the story until he could talk with her and know her wishes. He drew a sigh of weariness. It was a long, hard way he had come, and it was not over. The worst ordeal would be his confession to the bride, who was not his wife. The chief looked up. "'Could you make this out, Gordon?' he asked, noting keenly the young man's weary eyes, the strained, tense look about his mouth. "'Oh, yes, sir. I saw it at once. I was almost afraid my eyes might betray the secret before I got away with it. "'Then you know what you have saved the country, and what you have been worth to the service.' The young man flushed with pleasure. "'Thank you, sir,' he said, looking down. "'I understood it was important, and I am glad I was able to accomplish the errand without failing.' "'Have you reason to suppose you were followed, except for what you saw at the station in this city?' "'Yes, sir. I am sure there were detectives after me as I was leaving New York. They were suspicious of me. I saw one of the men who had been at the dinner with me, watching me. The disguise and some circumstances threw him off. He wasn't sure. Then there was a man, you know him, Balder, at Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh? Yes. You wonder how I got to Pittsburgh. You see, I was shadowed almost from the first, I suspect, for when I reached the station in New York, I was sure I recognized this man who had sat opposite me a few minutes before. I suppose my disguise, which you so thoughtfully provided, bothered him, for though he followed me about at a little distance, he didn't speak to me. I had to get on the first train that circumstances permitted, and perhaps the fact that it was a Chicago train made him think he was mistaken in me. Anyhow, I saw no more of him after the train left the station. Rather unexpectedly, I found I could get the drawing-room compartment, and went into immediate retirement, leaving the train at daylight where it was delayed on a side-track, and walked across country till I found a conveyance that took me to a Pittsburgh train. It didn't seem feasible to get away from the Chicago train any sooner, as the train made no further stops, and it was rather late at night by the time I boarded it. I thought I would run less risk by making a detour. I never dreamed they would have watchers out for me at Pittsburgh, and I can't think yet how they managed to get on my track. But almost the first minute I landed, I spied Balder stretching his neck over the crowds. I bolted from the station at once, and finding a carriage drawn up before the door, just ready for me, I got in and ordered them to drive me to East Liberty Station. I am afraid I shall always be suspicious of handy-closed carriages after this experience. I certainly have reason to be. The door was no sooner closed on me than the driver began to race like mad through the streets. I didn't think much of it at first, until he had been going some time, fully long enough to have reached East Liberty, and the horse was still rushing like a locomotive. Then I saw that we were in a lonely district of the city that seemed unfamiliar. That alarmed me, and I tapped on the window and called to the driver. He paid no attention. Then I found the doors were fastened shut and the windows plugged, so they wouldn't open. I discovered that an armed man rode beside the driver. I managed to get one of the doors open after a good deal of work, and escaped when we stopped for a freight train to pass. But I'm satisfied that I was being kidnapped, and if I hadn't gotten away just when I did, you would never have heard of me again, or the message either. 
I finally managed to reach East Liberty Station and jumped on the first train that came in, but I caught a glimpse of Balder stretching his neck over the crowd. He must have seen me and had Hale and Burke on the watch when I got here. They just missed me by a half second. They went over to the restaurant. Didn't expect me on a special, but I escaped them, and I'm mighty glad to get that little paper into your possession and out of mine. It's rather a long story to tell the whole, but I think you have the main facts. There was a suspicious glitter in the keen eyes of the kind old chief as he put out his hand and grasped Gordon's in a hearty shake, but all he said was, And you are all worn out. I'll guarantee you didn't sleep much last night. Well, no, said Gordon. I had to sit up in a day coach and share the seat with another man. Besides, I was somewhat excited. Of course, of course, puffed the old chief, coughing vigorously and showing by his gruff attitude that he was deeply affected. Well, young man, this won't be forgotten by the department. Now you go home and take a good sleep. Take the whole day off, if you wish, and then come down tomorrow morning and tell me all about it. Isn't there anything more I need to know at once, that justice may be done? I believe not, said Gordon, with a sigh of relief. There's a list of the men who were at the dinner with me. I wrote them down from memory last night when I couldn't sleep. I also wrote a few scraps of conversation, which will show you just how deep the plot had gone. If I had not read the message and known its import, I should not have understood what they were talking about. Hmm, yes. If there had been more time before you started, I might have told you all about it. Still, it seemed desirable that you should appear as much at your ease as possible. I thought this would be best accomplished by your knowing nothing of the import of the writing when you first met the people. I suppose it was as well that I did not know any more than I did. You are a great chief, sir. I was deeply impressed anew with that fact, as I saw how wonderfully you had planned for every possible emergency. It was simply great, sir. Pooh, pooh. Get you home into bed, said the old chief quite brusquely. He touched a bell, and a man appeared. Jessup, is the coast clear? he asked. Yes, sir, declared the darky. They have just had a couple of shots in de park, and now they took de villains off to de police station. De officers is out there waitin' to escort de genmen. Get home with you, Gordon, and don't come to the office till ten in the morning. Then come straight to my private room. Gordon thanked him, and left the room preceded by the gray-haired servant. He was surprised to find the policemen outside, and wondered still more that they seemed to be going one in front and the other behind him as he rode along. He was greatly relieved that he had not been called upon to give the whole story. His heart was filled with anxiety now to get back to the girl and tell her everything, and yet he dreaded it more than anything he had ever had to face in all his life. He sat back on the cushions, and covering his face with his hands, tried to think how he should begin, but he could see nothing but her sweet eyes filled with tears, think of nothing but the way she had looked and smiled during the beautiful morning they had spent together in the little town of Milton. Beautiful little Milton! Should he ever see it again? Celia, at her window, grew more and more nervous as an hour and then another half hour slipped slowly away, and still he did not come. Then two mounted policemen rode rapidly down the street following an automobile in which sat the man for whom she waited. She had no eyes now for the men who had been lurking across the way, and when she thought to look for them again, she saw them running in the opposite direction as fast as they could go, making wild gestures for a car to stop for them. She stood by the window and saw Gordon get out of the car and disappear into the building below, saw the car wheel and curve away, and the mounted police take up their stand on either corner, heard the clang of the elevator as it started up, and the clash of its door as it stopped at that floor, heard steps coming on toward the door and the key in the latch. Then she turned and looked at him, her two hands clasped before her, and her two eyes yearning, glad and fearful all at once. Oh, I have been so frightened about you. I am so glad you have come, she said, and caught her voice in a sob as she took one little step toward him. He threw his hat upon the floor, wherever it might land, and went to meet her, 
a great light glowing in his tired eyes, his arms outstretched to hers. "'And did you care?' he asked in a voice of almost awe. "'Dear, did you care what became of me?' He had come quite close to her now. "'Oh, yes, I cared. I could not help it.' There was a real sob in her voice now, though her eyes were shining. His arms went around her hungrily, as if he would draw her to him in spite of everything. Yet he kept them so encircling, without touching her, like a benediction that would enwrap the very soul of his beloved. Looking down into her face, he breathed softly. "'Oh, my dear, it seems as if I must hold you close and kiss you.' She looked up with bated breath and thought she understood. Then, with a lovely gesture of surrender, she whispered, "'I can trust you.' Her lashes were drooping now over her eyes. "'Not until you know all,' he said, and put her gently from him into the great armchair, with a look of reverence and self-abnegation she felt she would never forget. "'Then tell me quickly,' she said, a swift fear making her weak from head to foot. She laid her hand across her heart, as if to help steady its beating. He wheeled forward the leather couch opposite her chair and sat down, his head drooping, his eyes down. He dreaded to begin. She waited for the revelation, her eyes upon his bowed head. Finally he lifted his eyes and saw her look, and a tender light came into his face. "'It is a strange story,' he said. "'I don't know what you will think of me after it's told, but I want you to know that, blundering, stupid, even criminal though you may think me, I would sooner die this minute than cause you one more breath of suffering. Her eyes lit up with a wonderful light, and the ready tears sprang into them, tears that sparkled through the sunshine of a great joy that illumined her whole face. Please go on, she said softly, and added very gently, I believe you. But even with those words in his ears, the beginning was not easy. Gordon drew a deep breath and launched forth. I am not the man you think, he said, and looked at her to see how she would take it. My name is not George Hain. My name is Cyril Gordon. As one might launch an arrow at a beloved victim and long that it may not strike the mark, so he sent his truth home to her understanding and waited in breathless silence, hoping against hope that this might not turn her against him. Oh, she breathed softly, as if some puzzle were solving itself. Oh, this time not altogether in surprise, nor as if the fact were displeasing. She looked at him expectantly for further revelation, and he plunged into his story headlong. I'm a member of the Secret Service, headquarters here in Washington, and day before yesterday I was sent to New York on an important errand. A message of great import, written in a private code, had been stolen from one of our men. I was sent to get it before they could decipher it. The message involved matters of such tremendous significance that I was ordered to go under an assumed name, and on no account to let anyone know of my mission. My orders were to get the message, and let nothing hinder me in bringing it with all haste to Washington. I went with the full understanding that I might even be called upon to risk my life. He looked up. The girl sat wide-eyed with hands clasped together at her throat. He hurried on, not to cause her any needless anxiety. I won't weary you with details. There were a good many annoying hindrances on the way, which served to make me nervous. But I carried out the program laid down by my chief, and succeeded in getting possession of the message, and making my escape from the house of the man who had stolen it. As I closed the door behind me, knowing that it could be but a matter of a few seconds at longest, before six furious men would be on my track, who would stop at nothing to get back what I had taken from them, I saw a carriage standing almost before the house. The driver took me for the man he awaited, and I lost no time in taking advantage of his mistake. I jumped in, telling him to drive as fast as he could. I intended to give him further directions, but he had evidently had them from another quarter, and I thought I could call to him as soon as we were out of the dangerous neighborhood. To add to my situation, I soon became sure that an automobile and a motorcycle were following me. 
I recognized one of the men in the car as the man who sat opposite to me at the table a few minutes before. My coachman drove like mad, while I hurried to secure the message, so that if I were caught it would not be found, and to put on a slight disguise, some eyebrows and things the chief had given me. Before I knew where I was, the carriage had stopped before a building. At first I thought it was a prison, and the car and motorcycle came to a halt just behind me. I felt that I was pretty well trapped. The girl gave a low moan, and Gordon, not daring to look up, hurried on with his story. There isn't much more to tell you that you do not already know. I soon discovered the building was a church, not a prison. What happened afterward was the result of my extreme perturbation of mind, I suppose. I cannot account for my stupidity and subsequent cowardice in any other way. Neither was it possible for me to explain matters satisfactorily at any time during the whole mix-up, on account of the trust which I carried, and which I could on no account reveal even in confidence, or put in jeopardy in the slightest degree. Naturally, at first, my commission, and how to get safely through it all, was the only thing of importance to me. If you keep this in mind, perhaps you will be able to judge me less harshly. My only thought when the carriage came to a halt was how to escape from those two pursuers, and that more or less pervaded my mind during what followed, so that ordinary matters, which at another time would have been at once clear to me, meant nothing at all. You see, the instant that carriage came to a standstill, someone threw open the door, and I heard a voice call, Where is the best man? Then another voice said, Here he is. I took it that they thought I was best man but would soon discover that I wasn't when I came into the light. There wasn't any chance to slip away, or I should have done so, and vanished in the dark, but everybody surrounded me, and seemed to think I was all right. The two men who had followed were close behind, eyeing me keenly. I'm satisfied that they were to blame for that wild ride we took in Pittsburgh. I soon saw by the remarks that the man I was supposed to be had been away from this country for ten years, and of course, then, they would not be very critical. I tried twice to explain that there was a mistake, but both times they misunderstood me and thought I was saying I couldn't go in the procession because I hadn't practiced. I don't just know how I came to be in such a dreadful mess. It would seem as if it ought to have been a very easy thing to say I had got into the wrong carriage and they must excuse me, that I wasn't their man. But you see, they gave me no time to think nor to speak. They just turned me over from one man to another, and took everything for granted, and I, finding that I would have to break loose and flee before their eyes if I wished to escape, reflected that there would be no harm in marching down the aisle as best man in a delayed wedding, if that was all there was to do. I could disappear as soon as the ceremony was over, and no one would be the wiser. The real best man would probably turn up, and then they might wonder as they pleased, for I would be far away, and perhaps this was as good a place as any in which to hide for half an hour, until my pursuers were baffled, and well on their way seeking elsewhere for me. I can see now that I made a grave mistake in allowing even so much deception, but I did not see any harm in it then, and they all seemed in great distress for the ceremony to go forward. Bear in mind also that I was at that time entirely taken up with the importance of hiding my message until I could take it safely to my chief. Nothing else seemed to matter much. If the real best man was late to the wedding, and they were willing to use me in his place, what harm could come from it? He certainly deserved it for being late, and if he came in during the ceremony, he would think someone else had been put in his place. They introduced me to your brother, Jefferson, I thought he was the bridegroom, and I thought so until they laid your hand in mine. Oh, she moaned, and the little hand went to help its mate cover her face. I knew it, he said bitterly. I knew you would feel just that way as soon as you knew. I don't blame you. I deserve it. I was a fool, a villain, a dumb brute, whatever you have a mind to call me. You can't begin to understand how I have suffered for you since this happened, and how I have blamed myself. He got up suddenly and strode over to the window, frowning down into the sunlit street, and wondering how it was that everybody seemed to be going on in exactly the same hurry as ever, when for him 
life had suddenly come to a standstill. End of chapter 15「Chapter Sixteen of the Best Man This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Mattern. The Best Man by Grace Livingston Hill. Chapter Sixteen. The room was very still. The girl did not even sob. He turned after a moment and went back to that bowed golden head there in the deep crimson chair. Look here, he said. I know you can't ever forgive me. I don't expect it. I don't deserve it. But please, don't feel so awfully about it. I'll explain it all to everyone. I'll make it all right for you. I'll take every bit of blame on myself and get plenty of witnesses to prove all about it. The girl looked up with sorrow and surprise in her wet eyes. Why, I do not blame you, she said mournfully. I cannot see how you were to blame. It was no one's fault. It was just an unusual happening, a strange set of circumstances. I could not blame you. There is nothing to forgive, and if there were, I would gladly forgive it. Then what on earth makes you look so white and feel so distressed? he asked in a distracted voice, as a man will sometimes look and talk to the woman he loves when she becomes a tearful problem of despair to his obtuse eyes. Oh, don't you know? No, I don't, he said. You're surely not mourning for that brute of a man to whom you had promised to sacrifice your life. She shook her head and buried her face in her hands again. He could see that the tears were dropping between her fingers, and they seemed to fall red-hot upon his heart. Then what is it? His tone was almost sharp in its demand, but she only cried the harder. Her slender shoulders were shaking with her grief now. He put his hand down softly and touched her bowed head. Won't you tell me, dear? he breathed, and stooping knelt beside her. The sob ceased, and she was quite still for a moment, while his hand still lay on her hair with that gentle pleading touch. It is because you married me in that, that way without knowing. Oh, can't you see how terrible? Oh, the folly and blindness of love. Gordon got up from his knees as if she had stung him. You need not feel bad about that any more, he said in a hurt tone. Did I not tell you I would set you free at once? Surely no one in his senses could call you bound after such circumstances. She was very still for an instant, as if he had struck her, and then she raised her golden head, and a pair of sweet eyes suddenly grown haughty. You mean that I will set you free, she said coldly. I could not think of letting you be bound by a misunderstanding when you were under great stress of mind. You were in no wise to blame. I will set you free. As you please, he retorted bitterly, turning toward the window again. It all amounts to the same thing. There is nothing for you to feel bad about. Yes, there is, she answered with a quick rush of feeling that broke through her assumed haughtiness. I shall always feel that I have broken in upon your life. You have had a most trying experience with me, and you never can quite forget it. Things won't be the same. She paused, and the quiet tears chased each other eloquently down her face. No, said Gordon, still bitterly. Things will never be the same for me. I shall always see you sitting there in my chair. I shall always be missing you from it. But I am glad, glad. I would never have known what I missed if it had not been for this. He spoke almost savagely. He did not look around, but she was staring at him in astonishment, her blue eyes suddenly alight. "'What do you mean?' she asked softly. He wheeled round upon her. "'I mean that I shall never forget you, that I do not want to forget you. I should rather have had these two days of your sweet company than all my lifetime in any other companionship.' "'Oh!' she breathed. "'Then... Then why did you say what you did about being free? I didn't say anything about being free that I remember. It was you that said that. I said I would set you free. I could not, of course, hold you to a bond you did not want. But I did not say I did not want it. 
I said I would not hold you if you did not want to stay. Do you mean that if you had known me a little, that is, just as much as you know me now, and had come in there and found out your mistake before it was too late, that you would have wanted to go on with it? She waited for his answer breathlessly. If you had known me just as much as you do now, and had looked up and seen that it was I and not George Hayne you were marrying, would you have wanted to go on and be married? Her cheeks grew rosy and her eyes confused. I asked you first, she said with just a flicker of a smile. He caught the shimmer of light in her eyes and came toward her eagerly, his own face all aglow now with a dawning understanding. Darling, he said, I can go farther than you have asked. From the first minute my eyes rested upon your face under that mist of white veil, I wished with all my heart that I might have known you before any other man had found and won you. When you turned and looked at me with that deep sorrow in your eyes, you pledged me with every fiber of my being to fight for you. I was yours from that instant, and when your little hand was laid in mine, my heart went out in longing to have it stay in mine for ever. I know now, as I did not understand then, that the real reason for my not doing something to make known my identity at that instant was not because I was afraid of any of the things that might happen, or any scene I might make, but because my heart was fighting for the right to keep what had been given me out of the unknown. You are my wife, by every law of heaven and earth, if your heart will but say yes. I love you, as I never knew a man could love, and yet, if you do not want to stay with me, I will set you free. But it is true that I should never be the same, for I am married to you in my heart, and always shall be. Darling, look up and answer my question now. He stood before her with outstretched arms, and for answer she rose and came to him slowly with downcast eyes. I do not want to be set free, she said. Then gently, tenderly, he folded his arms about her, as if she were too precious to handle roughly, and laid his lips upon hers. It was the shrill, insistent clang of the telephone that broke in upon their bliss. For a moment Gordon let it ring, but its merciless clatter was not to be denied. So, drawing Celia close within his arm, he made her come with him to the phone. To his annoyance, the haughty voice of Miss Bentley answered him from the little black distance of the phone. His arm was about Celia, and she felt his whole body stiffen with formality. "'Oh, M Miss Bentley, good morning. Your message? Why, no. Ah, well, I have but just come in.' A pause, during which Celia, panic-stricken, handed him the paper on which she had written Julia's message. "'Ah, oh, oh, yes, I have the message. Yes, it is very kind of you,' he murmured stiffly. "'But you will have to excuse me. No, really.' It is utterly impossible. I have another engagement. His arm stole closer around Celia's waist and caught her hand, holding it with a meaningful pressure. He smiled with a grimace toward the telephone, which gladdened her heart. Pardon me? I didn't hear that, he went on. Oh, give up my engagement and come? Not possibly. His voice rang with a glad, decided force, and he held still closer the soft fingers in his hand. "'Well, I'm sorry you feel that way about it. "'I certainly am not trying to be disagreeable. "'No, I could not come tomorrow night either. "'I cannot make any plans for the next few days. "'I may have to leave town again. "'It is quite possible I may have to return to New York. "'Yes, business has been very pressing. "'I hope you will excuse me. "'I am sorry to disappoint you. "'No, of course I didn't do it on purpose. "'I shall have some pleasant news to tell you when I see you again.' or, with a glance of deep love at Celia, perhaps I shall find means to let you know of it before I see you. The color came and went in Celia's cheeks. She understood what he meant and nestled closer to him. No, no, I could not tell it over the phone. No, it will keep. Good things will always keep if they are well cared for, you know. No, really, I can't, and I'm very sorry to disappoint you tonight, but it can't be helped. Goodbye. He hung up the receiver with a sigh of relief. "'Who is Miss Bentley?' asked Celia with natural interest. She was pleased that he had not addressed her as Julia. "'Why, 
She is a, a friend, I suppose you would call her. She has been taking possession of my time lately, rather more than I really enjoyed. Still, she is a nice girl. You'll like her, I think. But I hope you'll never get too intimate. I shouldn't like to have her continually around. She... He paused and finished laughing. She makes me tired. I was afraid from her tone when she phoned you that she was a very dear friend, that she might be someone you cared for. There was a sort of proprietorship in her tone. Yes, that's the very word, proprietorship, he laughed. I couldn't care for her. I never did. I tried to consider her in that light one day, because I'd been told repeatedly that I ought to settle down. But the thought of having her with me always was, well, intolerable. The fact is, you reign supreme in a heart that has never loved another girl. I didn't know there was such a thing as love like this. I knew I lacked something, but I didn't know what it was. This is greater than all the gifts of life, this gift of your love and that it should come to me in this beautiful, unsought way seems too good to be true. He drew her to him once more, and looked down into her lovely face, as if he could not drink enough of its sweetness. And to think you are willing to be my wife, my wife! And he folded her close again. A discreet tap on the door announced the arrival of the man Henry, and Gordon roused to the necessity of ordering lunch. He stepped to the door with a happy smile and held it open. "'Come in a minute, Henry,' he said. "'This is my wife. I hope you will henceforth take her wishes as your special charge, and do for her as you have done so faithfully for me.' The man's eyes shone with pleasure as he bowed low before the gentle lady. "'I's very glad to hear it, sir, and I offers you my congratulations, sir, and a lady, too.' She can't find no better man in the whole United States than Mars Gordon. I's mighty glad you done got married, sir, and I hopes you both have a mighty fine life. The luncheon was served in Henry's best style, and his dark face shone as he stepped noiselessly about, putting silver and china and glass in place, and casting admiring glances at the lady, who stood holding the little miniature in her hand and asking questions with a gentle voice. "'Your mother, you say? How dear she is! And she died so long ago. You never knew her? Oh, how strange and sweet and pitiful to have a beautiful girl mother like that!' She put out her hand to his in the shelter of the deep window, and they thought Henry did not see the look and touch that passed between them. But he discreetly averted his eyes and smiled benignly at the salt cellars and the celery he was arranging. Then he hurried out to a florist next door, and returned with a dozen white roses, which he arranged in a queer little crystal pitcher, one of the few articles belonging to his mother that Gordon possessed. It had never been used before, except to stand on the mantel. It was after they had finished their delightful luncheon, and Henry had cleared the table and left the room, that Gordon remarked, "'I wonder what has become of George Hayne. Do you suppose he means to try to make trouble?' Celia's hands fluttered to her throat with a little gesture of fear. Oh, she said, I had forgotten him. How terrible! He will do something, of course. He will do everything. He will probably carry out all his threats. How could I have forgotten? Perhaps Mamma is now in great distress. What can we do? What can I do? She looked up at him helplessly, and his heart bounded at the thought that she was his to protect as long as life should last, and that she already depended upon him. "'Don't be frightened,' he soothed her. "'He cannot do anything very dreadful, and if he tries, we'll soon silence him. What he has written in those letters is blackmail. He is simply a big coward, who will run and hide as soon as he is exposed. He thought you did not understand law.' and so took advantage of you. I'm sure I can silence him. Oh, do you think so? But Mamma, poor Mamma, it will kill her. And George will stop at nothing when he is crossed. I have known him too long. It will be terrible if he carries out his threat. Tears were in her eyes. Agony was in her face. We must telephone your mother at once, and set her heart at rest. Then we can find out just what ought to be done said Gordon soothingly. 
It was unforgivably thoughtless of me not to have done it before. Celia's face was radiant at the thought of speaking to her mother. Oh, how beautiful! Why didn't I think of that before? What perfectly dear things telephones are! With one accord they went to the telephone table. Shall you call them up, or shall I? he asked. You call, and then I will speak to Mamma, she said, her eyes shining with her joy in him. I want them to hear your voice again. They can't help knowing you are all right when they hear your voice. For that he gave her a glance very much worth having. Just how do you account for the fact that you didn't think I was all right yesterday afternoon? I have a very realizing sense that you didn't. I used my voice to the best of my ability, but it did no good then. Well, you see, that was different. There were those letters to be accounted for. Mamma and Jeff don't know anything about the letters. And what are you going to tell them now? She drew her brows down a minute and thought. You'd better find out how much they already know, he suggested. If this George Hayne hasn't turned up yet, perhaps you can wait until you can write. Or we might be able to go up tomorrow and explain it ourselves. Oh, could we? How lovely! I think we could, said Gordon. I'm sure I can make it possible. Of course, you know a wedding journey isn't exactly in the program of the Secret Service, but I might be able to work them for one. I surely can in a few days, if this Holman business doesn't hold me up. I may be needed for a witness. I'll have to talk with the chief first. Oh, how perfectly beautiful! Then you call them up, and just say something pleasant, anything, you know, and then say I'll speak to Mamma. She gave him the number, and in a few minutes a voice from New York said, Hello! Hello, called Gordon. Is this Mr. Jefferson Hathaway? Well, this is your new brother-in-law. How are you all? Your mother recovered from all the excitement and weariness? That's good. What's that? You've been trying to phone us in Chicago? But we're not in Chicago. We changed our minds and came to Washington instead. Yes, we're in Washington, the Harris Apartments. We have been very selfish not to have communicated with you sooner. At least I have. Celia hasn't had any choice in the matter. I've kept her so busy. Yes, she's very well and seems to look happy. She wants to speak for herself. I'll try to arrange to bring her up tomorrow for a little visit. I want to see you, too. We've a lot of things to explain to you. Here is Celia. She wants to speak to you. Celia, her eyes shining, her lips quivering with suppressed excitement, took the receiver. Oh, Jeff, dear, it's good to hear your voice, she said. Is everything all right? Yes, I've been having a perfectly beautiful time, and I've something fine to tell you. All those nice things you said to me just before you got off the train are true. Yes, he's just as nice as you said, and a great deal nicer besides. Oh, yes, I'm very happy, and I want to speak to Mamma, please. Jeff, is she all right? Is she perfectly well and not fretting a bit? You know you promised to tell me. What's that? She thought I looked sad? Well, I did, but that's all gone now. Everything is perfectly beautiful. Tell Mother to come to the phone, please. I want to make her understand. I'm going to tell her, dear, she whispered, looking up at Gordon. I'm afraid George will get there before we do, and make her worry. For answer, he stooped and kissed her, his arm encircling her and drawing her close. Whatever you think best, dearest, he whispered back. Is that you, Mamma? With a happy smile, she turned back to the phone. Dear Mamma, yes, I'm all safe and happy, and I'm so sorry you have worried. We won't let you do it again. But listen, I've got something to tell you, a surprise, Mamma. I did not marry George Hayne at all. No, I say I did not marry George Hayne at all. George Hayne is a wicked man. I can't tell you about it over the phone, but that was why I looked so sad. Yes, I was married all right, but not to George. He's, oh, so different, Mother. You can't think. He's right here beside me now, and, Mother, he's just as dear. You'd be very happy about him if you could see him. What did you say? Didn't I mean to marry George? Why, Mother, I never wanted to. I was awfully unhappy about it, and I knew I made you feel so too, though I tried not to. But I'll explain all about it. 
you'll be perfectly satisfied when you know all about it no there's nothing whatever for you to worry about everything is right now and life looks more beautiful to me than it ever did before what's his name oh she looked up at gordon with a funny little expression of dismay she had forgotten and he whispered it in her ear cyril it's cyril mother isn't that a pretty name which name oh the first name of course the last name gordon he supplied in her ear again cyril gordon mother she said giggling in spite of herself at her strange predicament yes mother i am very very happy i couldn't be happier unless i had you and jeff too and she paused hesitating at the unaccustomed name and cyril says we're coming to visit you to-morrow we'll come up and see you and explain everything and you're not to worry about george hayne if he comes just let jeff put him off by telling him you have sent for me or something of the sort and don't pay any attention to what he says what you say he did come how strange and he hasn't been back i'm so thankful he's dreadful oh mother you don't know what i've escaped and cyril is good and dear what you want to speak to him all right he's right here good-bye mother dear till to-morrow and you'll promise not to worry about anything all right here is cyril gordon took the receiver mother i'm taking good care of her just as i promised and i'm going to bring her for her flying visit up to see you to-morrow yes i'll take good care of her she is very dear to me the best thing that ever came into my life then a mother's blessing came thrilling over the wires and touched the handsome manly face with tenderness thank you he said i shall try always to make you glad you said those words they returned to looking in each other's eyes after the receiver was hung up as if they had been parted a long time it seemed somehow as if their joy must be greater than any other married couple because they had all their courting yet to do it was beautiful to think of what was before them there was so much on both sides to be told and to be told over again because only half had been told and there were so many hopes and experiences to be exchanged so many opinions to compare and to rejoice over because they were alike on many essentials then there were the rooms to be gone through and gordon's pictures and favorite books to look at and talk about and plans for the future to be touched upon just barely touched upon the apartment would do until they could look about and get a house gordon said his heart swelling with the proud thought that at last he would have a real home like his other married friends with a real princess to preside over it then celia had to tell all about the horror of the last three months with the unpleasant shadows of the preceding years back of it she told this in the dusk of evening before henry had come in to light up and before they had realized that it was almost dinner time she told it with her face hidden on her husband's shoulder and his arms close about her to give her comfort at each revelation of the story they tried also to plan what to do about George Hayne, and then there was the whole story of Gordon's journey and commission, from the time the old chief had called him into the office, until he came to stand beside her at the church altar, and they were married. It was told in careful detail, with all the comical, exasperating, and pitiful incidents of white dog and little newsboy, but the strangest part about it all was that Gordon never said one word about Julia Bentley and her imaginary presence with him that first day, and he never even knew that he had left out an important detail. Celia laughed over the white dog and declared they must bring him home to live with them, and she cried over the story of the brave little newsboy and was eager to visit him in New York, promising herself all sorts of pleasure in taking him gifts and permanently bettering his condition and it was in this way that gordon incidentally learned that his wife had a fortune in her own right a fact that for a time gave him great uneasiness of mind until she had soothed him and laughed at him for an hour or more for gordon was an independent creature and had ideas about supporting his wife by his own toil besides it seemed an unfair advantage to have taken a wife and a fortune as it were unaware 
But Celia's fortune had not spoiled her, and she soon made him see that it had always been a mere incident in her scheme of living. Comfortable and pleasant incident, to be sure, but still an incident to be kept always in the background, and never for a moment to be a cause for self-congratulation or pride. Gordon found himself dreading the explanation that would have to come when he reached New York and faced his wife's mother and brother. Celia had accepted his explanations, because somehow by the beautiful ways of the spirit, her soul had found and believed in his soul before the truth was made known to her. But would her mother and brother be able also to believe? And he fell to planning with Celia just how he should tell the story, and this led to his bringing out a number of letters and papers that would be worth while showing as credentials, and every step of the way, as Celia got glimpse after glimpse into his past, her face shone with joy, and her heart leaped with the assurance that her lot had been cast in goodly places, for she perceived not only that this man was honored and respected in high places, but that his early life had been particularly pure and true. The strange loneliness that had surrounded his young manhood seemed suddenly to have broken ahead of him, and to have opened out into the glory of the companionship of one peculiarly fitted to fill the need of his life. Thus they looked into one another's eyes, reading their life joy, and entered into the beautiful miracle of acquaintanceship. End of chapter 16 17 of the best man this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by gail mattern the best man by grace livingston hill chapter 17 the next morning quite early the phone called gordon to the office the chief secretary said the matter was urgent he hurried away leaving celia somewhat anxious lest their plans for going to new york that day could not be carried out but she made up her mind not to fret even if the trip had to be put off a little, and solaced herself with a short visit with her mother over the telephone. Gordon entered his chief's office a trifle anxiously, for he felt that in justice to his wife he ought to take her right back to New York and get matters there adjusted, but he feared that there would be business to hold him at home until the Holman matter was settled. The chief greeted him affably and bade him sit down. "'I am sorry to have called you up so early,' he said, "'but we needed you. The fact is, they've arrested Holman and five other men, and you are in immediate demand to identify them. Would it be asking too much of an already overworked man to send you back to New York today?' Gordon almost sprang from his seat in pleasure. "'It just exactly fits in with my plans.' or, rather, my wishes, he said, smiling. There are several matters of my own that I would like to attend to in New York, and for which, of course, I did not have time. He paused and looked at his chief, half hesitating, marveling that the way had so miraculously opened for him to keep silence a little longer on the subject of his marriage. Perhaps the chief need never be told that the marriage ceremony took place on the day of the Holman dinner. That is good, said the chief, smiling. You certainly have earned the right to attend to your own affairs. Then we need not feel so bad at having to send you back. Can you go on the afternoon train? Good. Then let us hear your account of your trip briefly, to see if there are any points we didn't notice yesterday. But first, just step here a moment. I have something to show you. He flung open the door to the next office. You knew that Ferry had left the department on account of his ill health? I have taken the liberty of having your things moved in here. This will hereafter be your headquarters, and you will be next to me in the department. Gordon turned in amazement and gazed at the kindly old face. Promotion he had hoped for, but such promotion, right over the heads of his elders and superiors, he had never dreamed of receiving. He could have taken the chief in his arms. Poo, poo, said the chief. You deserve it. You deserve it when Gordon tried to blunder out some words of appreciation. Then, as if to cap the climax, he added, And by the way, you know someone has got to run across the water to look after that Stanhope matter. That will fall to you, I'm afraid. Sorry to keep you trotting around the globe, 
but perhaps you will like to make a little vacation of it. The department will give you some time if you want it. Oh, don't thank me. It's simply the reward of doing your duty, to have more duties given you, and higher ones. You have done well, young man. I have here all the papers in the Stanhope case, and full directions written out. And then, if you can plan for it, you needn't return unless it suits your pleasure. You understand the matter as fully as I do already. And now for business. Let's hurry through. There are one or two little matters we must talk over, and I know you will want to hurry back and get ready for your journey. And so, after all the account of Gordon's extraordinary escape and eventful journey home became by reason of its hasty repetition a most prosaic story composed of the bare facts, and not all of those. At parting, the chief pressed Gordon's hand with heartiness, and ushered him out into the hall, with the same brusque manner he used to close all business interviews, and Gordon found himself hurrying through the familiar halls in a daze of happiness, the secret of his unexpected marriage, still his own, and hers. Celia was watching at the window when his key clicked in the lock, and he let himself into the apartment, his face alight with the joy of meeting her again after the brief absence. She turned in a quiver of pleasure at his coming. "'Well, get ready,' he said joyfully. "'We are ordered off to New York on the afternoon train, with a wedding trip to Europe into the bargain, and I'm promoted to the next place to the chief. What do you think of that for a morning surprise?' He tossed up his hat like a boy, came over to where she stood, and, stooping, laid reverent lips upon her brow and eyes. "'Oh, beautiful, lovely!' cried Celia ecstatically. "'Come, sit down on the couch and tell me about it. We can work faster afterward if we get it off our minds. Was your chief very much shocked that you were married without his permission or knowledge?' "'Why, that was the best of all. I didn't have to tell him I was married.' and he is not to know until just as I sail. He need never know how it all happened. It isn't his business, and it would be hard to explain. No one need ever know, except your mother and brother, unless you wish them to, dear. Oh, I am so glad and relieved, said Celia delightedly. I've been worrying about that a little. What people would think of us? For, of course, we couldn't possibly explain it all out as it is to us. They would always be watching us to see if we really cared for each other, and suspecting that we didn't, and it would be horrid. I think it is our own precious secret, and nobody but Mama and Jeff have a right to know, don't you? I certainly do, and I was casting about my mind as I went into the office how I could manage not to tell the chief, when what did he do but spring a proposition on me to go at once to New York and identify those men. He apologized tremendously for having to send me right back again, but said it was necessary. I told him it just suited me, for I had affairs of my own that I had not had time to attend to when I was there, and would be glad to go back and see to them. That let me out on the wedding question, for it would be only necessary to tell him I was married when I got back. He would never ask when. But the announcements, said Celia, catching her breath laughingly, I never thought of that. We'll just have to have some kind of announcements, or my friends will not understand about my new name, and we'll have to send him one, won't we? Why, I don't know. Couldn't we get along without announcements? You can explain to your intimate friends, and the others won't ever remember the name after a few months. We'll not be likely to meet many of them right away. I'll write to my chief and tell him informally, leaving out the date entirely. He won't miss it. If we have announcements at all, we needn't send him one. He wouldn't be likely ever to see one any other way, or to notice the date. I think we can manage that matter. We'll talk it over with your... He hesitated, and then, smiling tenderly, added, We'll talk it over with Mother. How good it sounds to say that. I never knew my mother, you know. Celia nestled her hands in his and murmured, Oh, I'm so happy, so happy. "'But I don't understand how you got a wedding trip "'without telling your chief about our marriage.' "'Easy as anything. "'He asked me if I would mind running across the water "'to attend to a matter for the service, "'and said I might have extra time while there for a vacation. "'He never suspects that vacation is to be used as a wedding trip. "'I'll write him or phone him the night we leave New York. 
I may have to stay in the city two or three days to get this Holman matter settled, and then we can be off. In the meantime, you can spend the time reconciling your mother to her new son. Do you think we'll have a very hard time explaining matters to her? Not a bit, said Celia gaily. She never did like George. It was the only thing we ever disagreed about, my marrying him. She suspected all the time I wasn't happy, and couldn't understand why I insisted on marrying him when I hadn't seen him for ten years. She begged me to wait until he had been back in the country for a year or two, but he would not hear to such a thing, and threatened to carry out his worst at once. Gordon's heart suddenly contracted with righteous wrath over the cowardliness of the man who sought to gain his own ends by intimidating a woman, and this woman— so dear, so beautiful, so lovely in her nature. It seemed the man's heart must indeed be black to have done what he did. He mentally resolved to search him out and bring him to justice as soon as he reached New York. It puzzled him to understand how easily he seemed to have abandoned his purposes. Perhaps after all he was more of a coward than they thought, and had not dared to remain in the country when he found out that Celia had braved his wrath and married another man. He would find out about him and set the girl's heart at rest, just as soon as possible, that any embarrassment at some future time might be avoided. Gordon stooped and kissed his wife again, a caress that seemed to promise all reparation for the past. But it suddenly occurred to the two that trains did not wait for lovers long loitering, and with one accord they went to work. Celia, of course, had very little preparation to make, her trunk was probably in Chicago, and would need to be wired for. Gordon attended to that the first thing, looking up the number of the check and ordering it back to New York by telegraph. Turning from the telephone, he rang for the man and asked Celia to give the order for lunch while he got together some things that he must take with him. A stay of several weeks would necessitate a little more baggage than he had taken to New York. He went into the bedroom and began pulling out things to pack, but when Celia turned from giving her directions, she found him standing in the bedroom doorway with an old-fashioned velvet jewel case in his hand, which he had just taken from the little safe in his room. His face wore a wonderful tender light, as if he had just discovered something precious. Dear, he said, I wonder if you will care for these. They were mother's. Perhaps this ring will do until I can buy you a new one. See if it will fit you. It was my mother's. He held out a ring containing a diamond of singular purity and brilliance in a quaint, old-fashioned setting. Celia put out her hand with its wedding ring, the ring that he had put upon her finger at the altar, and he slipped the other jeweled one above it. It fitted perfectly. It is a beauty, breathed Celia, holding out her hand to admire it, and I would far rather have it than a new one, your dear little mother. There's not much else here but a little string of pearls and a pin or two. I have always kept them near me. Somehow they seemed like a link between me and mother. I was keeping them for... He hesitated, and then, giving her a rare smile, he finished. I was keeping them for you. Her answering look was eloquent and needed no words, which was well, for Henry appeared at that moment to serve luncheon and remind his master that his train left in a little over two hours. There was no further time for sentiment. And yet these two, it seemed, could not be practical that day. They idled over their luncheon and dawdled over their packing, stopping to look at this and that picture or bit of bric-a-brac that Gordon had picked up in some of his travels, and Henry finally had to take things in his own hands, pack them off, and send their baggage after them. Henry was a capable man, and rejoiced to see the devotion of his master and his new mistress. But he had a practical head, and knew where his part came in. End of chapter 17this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Mattern. The Best Man by Grace Livingston Hill. Chapter 18. The journey back to New York seemed all too brief for those two whose lives had just been blended so unexpectedly, and every mile was filled with a new and sweet discovery of delight in one another. And then, 
when they reached the city they rushed in on mrs hathaway and the eager young jeff like two children who had so much to tell they did not know where to begin mrs hathaway settled the matter by insisting on their going to dinner immediately and leaving all explanations until afterward and with the servants present of course there was little that could be said about the matter that each one had most at heart but there was a spirit of deep happiness in the atmosphere and one couldn't possibly entertain any fears under the influence of the radiant smiles that passed between mother and daughter, husband and wife, brother and sister. As soon as the meal was concluded, the mother led them up to her private sitting-room, and closing the door she stood facing them all, as half breathless with the excitement of the moment they stood in a row before her. "'My three dear children,' she murmured, Gordon's eyes lit with joy, and his heart thrilled with the wonder of it all. Then the mother stepped up to him, and placing her hand on his arm, led him over to the couch, and made him sit beside her, while the brother and sister sat down together close by. "'Now, Cyril, my new son,' she said deliberately, her eyes resting approvingly upon his face, "'you may tell me your story.' I see my girl has lost both head and heart to you, and I doubt if she could tell it connectedly. And while Celia and Jeff were laughing at this, Gordon set about his task of winning a mother, and incidentally an eager-eyed young brother, who was more than half committed to his cause already. Celia watched proudly as her handsome husband took out his credentials and began his explanation. First, I must tell you who I am, and these papers will do it better than I could. Will you look at them, please? He handed her a few letters and papers. These papers on the top show the rank and position that my father and my grandfather held with the government and in the army. This is a letter from the President to my father, congratulating him on his approaching marriage with my mother. That paper contains my mother's family tree, and the letters with it will give you an idea of the honor in which my mother's family was held in Washington, and in Virginia, her old home. I know these matters are not of much moment, and say nothing whatever about what I am myself, but they are things you would have been likely to know about my family if you had known me all my life, and at least they will tell you that my family was respectable." Mrs. Hathaway was examining the papers, and suddenly looked up, exclaiming, my dear my father knew your grandfather i think i saw him once when he came to our home in new york it was years ago and i was a young girl but i remember he was a fine-looking man with keen dark eyes and a heavy head of iron-gray hair she looked at gordon keenly i wonder if your eyes are not like his it was long ago of course they used to say i looked like him i do not remember him he died when I was very young. The mother looked up with a pleasant smile. Now, tell me about yourself, she said, and laid a gentle hand on his. Gordon looked down, an embarrassed flush spreading over his face. There's nothing great to tell, he said. I've always tried to live a straight, true life, and I've never been in love with any girl before. He flashed a wonderful blinding smile upon Celia. I was left alone in the world when quite young, and have lived around in boarding schools and college. I am a graduate of Harvard, and I've traveled a little. There was some money left from my father's estate, not much. I'm not rich. I'm a secret service man, and I love my work. I get a good salary, and was this morning promoted to the position next in rank to my chief, so that now I shall have still more money. I shall be able to make your daughter comfortable and give her some of the luxuries, if not all, to which she has been accustomed. "'My dear boy, that part is not what I am about,' interrupted the mother. "'I know,' said Gordon, "'but it is a detail you have a right to be told. I understand that you care far more what I am than how much money I can make, and I promise you I am going to try to be all that you would want your daughter's husband to be. Perhaps the best thing I can say for myself is that I love her better than my life,' and I mean to make her happiness the dearest thing in life to me. The mother's look of deep understanding answered him more eloquently than words could have done, and after a moment she spoke again. 
but I do not understand how you could have known one another, and I never have heard of you. Celia is not good at keeping things from her mother, though the last three months she has had a sadness that I could not fathom, and was forced to lay to her natural dread of leaving home. She seemed so insistent upon having this marriage, just as George planned it, and I was so afraid she would regret not waiting. How could you have known one another all this time, and she never talked to me about it, and why did George Hayne have any part whatever in it, if you two loved one another? Just how long have you known each other, anyway? Did it begin when you visited in Washington last spring, Celia? With dancing eyes, Celia shook her head. No, Mamma, if I had met him then, I'm sure George Hayne would never have had anything to do with the matter, for Cyril would have known how to help me out of my difficulty. I shall have to tell you the whole story from my standpoint, and from the beginning, said Gordon, dreading now that the crisis was upon him, what the outcome would be. I have wanted you to know who and what I was before you knew the story, that you might judge me as kindly as possible, and know that however I may have been to blame in the matter, it was through no intention of mine. My story may sound rather impossible. I know it will seem improbable, but it is nevertheless true. Everything that I have to tell. May I hope to be believed? I think you may, answered the mother, searching his face anxiously. Those eyes of yours are not lying eyes. Thank you, he said simply, and then gathering all his courage, he plunged into his story. Mrs. Hathaway was watching him with searching interest. Jeff had drawn his chair up close, and could scarcely restrain his excitement, and when Gordon told of his commission, he burst forth explosively. Gee! But that was a great stunt. I'd have liked to have been along with you. You must be simply great to be trusted with a thing like that. But his mother gently reproved him. Hush, my son, let us hear the story. Celia sat quietly watching her husband with pride, two bright spots of color on her cheeks, and her hands clasping each other tightly. She was hearing many details now that were new to her. Once more, when Gordon mentioned the dinner at Holman's, Jeff interrupted with, Holman? Holman? Not J.P.? Why, of course, we know him. Celia was one of his daughter's bridesmaids last spring. The old lynx! I always thought he was crooked. People hint a lot of things about him. Jeff, dear, let us hear the story, again insisted his mother, and the story continued. Gordon had been looking down as he talked. He dreaded to see their faces as the truth should dawn upon them. But when he had told all, he lifted honest eyes to the white-faced mother and pleaded with her. Indeed, indeed, I hope you will believe me, that not until they laid your daughter's hand in mine did I know that I was supposed to be the bridegroom. I thought all the time her brother was the bridegroom. If I had not been so distraught and trying so hard to think how to escape, I suppose I would have noticed that I was standing next to her, and that everything was peculiar about the whole matter, but I didn't. And then, when I suddenly knew that she and I were being married, what should I have done? Do you think I ought to have stopped the ceremony then and there, and made a scene before all those people? What was the right thing to do? Suppose my commission had been entirely out of the question, and I had had no duty toward the government to keep entirely quiet about myself. Do you think I ought to have made a scene? Would you have wanted me to, for your daughter's sake? Tell me, please, he insisted gently. And while she hesitated, he added, I did some pretty hard thinking during that first quarter of a second that I realized what was happening, and I tell you honestly, I didn't know what was the right thing to do. It seemed awful for her sake to make a scene, and to tell you the truth, I worshipped her from the moment my eyes rested upon her. There was something sad and appealing as she looked at me that seemed to pledge my very life to save her from trouble. Tell me, do you think I ought to have stopped the ceremony then, at the first moment of my realization that I was being married? The mother's face had softened as she watched him and listened to his tender words about Celia, and now she answered gently, I am not sure. Perhaps not. It was a very grave question to face. 
I don't know that I can blame you for doing nothing. It would have been terrible for her, and us, and everybody, and have made it all so public. Oh, I think you did right not to do anything publicly, perhaps, and yet it is terrible to me to think you have been forced to marry my daughter in that way. Please, do not say forced, mother, said Gordon, laying both hands earnestly upon hers and looking into her eyes. I tell you one thing that held me back from doing anything, was that I so earnestly desired that what I was passing through might be real and lasting. I have never seen one like her before. I know that if the mistake had been righted, and she had passed out of my life, I should never have felt the same again. I am glad, glad with all my heart that she is mine. And, Mother, I think she is glad, too. The mother turned toward her daughter, and Celia, with starry eyes, came and knelt before them, and laid her hands in the hands of her husband, saying with ringing voice, Yes, dear little mother, I am gladder than I ever was before in my life. And kneeling thus, with her husband's arm about her, her face against his shoulder, and both her hands clasped in his, she told her mother about the tortures that George Hayne had put her through, until the mother turned white with horror at what her beloved and cherished child had been enduring, and the brother got up and stormed across the floor, vowing vengeance on the luckless head of poor George Hayne. Then, after the mother had given her blessing to the two, and Jeff had added an original one of his own, there was the whole story of the eventful wedding trip to tell, which they both told by solos amid choruses, until the hour grew alarmingly late, and the mother suddenly sent them all off to bed. The next few days were both busy and happy ones for the two. They went to the hospital and gladdened the life of the little newsboy with fruit and toys and many promises, and they brought home a happy white dog from his boarding place, whom Jeff adopted as his own. Gordon had a trying hour or two at court with his one-time host, the scoundrel who had stolen the cipher message, and the thick-set man glared at him from a cell window as he passed along the corridor of the prison whither he had gone in search of George Hayne. Gordon, in his search for the lost bridegroom, whom for many reasons he desired to find as soon as possible, had asked the help of one of the men at work on the Holman case in searching for a certain George Hayne, who needed very much to be brought to justice. "'Oh, you won't have to search for him,' declared the man with a smile. "'He safely landed in prison three days ago. "'He was caught as neatly as rolling off a log "'by the son of the man whose name he forged several years ago. "'It was trust money of a big corporation, "'and the man died in his place in a prison cell. "'But the son means to see the real culprit punished.' "'And so Gordon, in the capacity of Celia's lawyer, "'went to the prison to talk with George Hayne, and that miserable man found no excuse for his sins when the searching talk was over. Gordon did not let the man know who he was, and merely made it understood that Celia was married, and that, if he attempted to make her any further trouble, the whole thing would be exposed, and he would have to answer a grave charge of blackmail. The days passed rapidly, and at last the New York matter for which Gordon's presence was needed was finished, and he was free to sail away with his bride. On the morning of their departure, Gordon's voice rang out over the miles of telephone wires to his old chief in Washington. I am married, and am just starting on my wedding trip. Don't you want to congratulate me? And the old chief's gruff voice sounded back, Good work, old man. Congratulations for you both. She may or may not be the best girl in all the world. I haven't had a chance to see yet. But she's a lucky girl, for she's got the best man I know. Tell her that for me. Bless you both. I'm glad she's going with you. It won't be so lonesome. Gordon gave her the message that afternoon, as they sailed straight into the sunshine of a beautiful new life together. Dear, he said, as he arranged her steamer rug more comfortably about her, has it occurred to you that you are probably the only bride who ever married the best man at her wedding? Celia smiled appreciatively, and after a minute replied mischievously, I suppose every bride thinks her husband is the best man. End of chapter 18 End 
of the best man.